Guardian Bay Delta Fishery Resources related to Phase 2 of the State Water Resources Control Board review of the 2006 Water Quality Control Plan for the Bay Delta Estuary. I'm Charlie Hoppin, Chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, with me here today, Francis Spivey Weber, my Vice Chair. To her left, Felicia, Board Member Felicia Marcus. To my right, Stephen Moore and Tam Doduck will be joining us shortly. Uh, present today from staff are Rich Satkowski, Senior Engineer, Karen Nia, Senior Engineer, and Diane Riddle, Environmental Program Manager, and Dr. Bert Bart Brock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not a difficult name to say, really, is it? I don't have any place to hide, Brock. Dr. Brock Bernstein, a subcontractor for, uh, for ICF International, who is the workshop facilitator. As you all know, we need to go through the evacuation procedure. If you hear something that sounds like it means you need to get out of your chair, uh, if you would, uh, please look at the back of the room. There are two exit signs. If you would, uh, proceed down the stairs in as orderly fashion as you possibly can, depending on the degree of the fire, and across the street to Chavez Park. Um, <laughs> I forgot. You're also supposed to take your valuables with you and do not use the elevator. Oh, my God. Who wrote that? I know we've got it. If you if we didn't put that down, this place is going to catch on fire, and somebody's going to leave their wedding ring and sue us. I know it. I, that's the way it's going to work. Also, if needed, we have set up an overflow room uh, in 230, which is out the back door to the left and past the bathrooms. Um, back to the workshop. Uh, this workshop is being held in accordance with a public notice dated June 22nd, 2012, and revised August 15th, 2012. It's an informal workshop. The State Board will not take any formal action today, and there will be no sworn testimony or cross-examination of participants. However, the State Board and the staff do plan to ask questions of the panelists. There will be approximately 15 minutes for questions after each presentation and a time for questions at the end of this second day. Uh, there will be no court reporter present today. We are, however, broadcasting this workshop on the Internet and preparing an audio and video recording. So please be sure that when you come to the microphone, you speak into it clearly and identify whom it is that you are representing and your name, if you would. Uh, first, we'll hear from the various panels. After the panels have presented their information, we'll hear comments from the public. If you intend to speak today, please fill out a blue speaker card and give it to our staff. If you're not sure whether you wish to speak, fill out a card and mark if necessary. In order to ensure that all participants have an opportunity to participate, comments may be limited to five minutes per speaker. To avoid repetition and in the interest of time, if there are groups of you uh, with the same comments, I would encourage you to sp pick a spokesperson and present your comments. Quite frankly, it's much more effective than just repeating ad nauseum uh, the same comment. Uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Brock Bernstein to introduce the first panel today. Thank you, Brock. Thank you. We have three panels scheduled today. The first one is the in-delta water interests. You guys have organized yourselves. Just a reminder, if you aren't speaking, please turn your microphone off. Um, also, if you have other members of your team who are not speaking but you want to be available for questions, space permitting, you can have them sit up in the front. So it's all yours. Good morning, Chairman Hoppin, members of the board and staff. Ma'am, before you get started, yes. there's something that I forgot to do that's very important to me. Sure. If you'd all turn these things off, please. And all of you that are panelists, you have to listen to this. We, I, John Herrick, you probably heard this, what, 100 times? <coughs> Maybe 120? When you speak into these microphones, they aren't very good, so really center up on them or we're not going to be able to hear you. Thank you. Okay, you let me know if I'm so close that uh, I'm blasting your ears, though. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the first panel this morning is the In Delta Water Interest Panel, and there's three of us who have come to uh, be available for you for questions or to give presentations. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District, um, and joining me today are... Deanna Serino from the Contra Costa Water District. She'll also have a presentation. 
And then also joining us is Mike Connor from um, the Bay Area Clean Water Association. And uh, I believe he's got, you know, maybe five minutes or so of, of comments um, that he'll give uh, third in, in line. Oh, I guess he's going to go uh, right after me. Okay, so the title of my presentation this morning is Addressing Uncertainty Regarding the Pelagic Food Web, Perspectives and Suggestions. So one of your charges to workshop participants was to provide suggestions on how to address uncertainty and change and how to implement an adaptive management program. So my goal in this talk is to provide several suggestions for addressing scientific uncertainty related to the pelagic food web. So I'll be addressing fish food more directly instead of fishes. My suggestions fall into four general categories which are listed here. One, tackle key uncertainties regarding the Sacramento River as a source of pelagic food. Two, when managing flows, consider the direct effects of residence time on zooplankton and phytoplankton. Three, incorporate benthic grazing into the BDCP effects analysis. And three, branch out from cubitainer research, um, which refers to an additional experimental approach I'd like to recommend for testing um, hypotheses about the delta food web. I regularly admit my ignorance on certain things, and I'll do that here. The term benthic grazing is new to me. Would you define that? Oh, I'm that? so sorry. Um, yeah, it's don't the same apologize as to me. I'm the one that should probably understand that, and I don't. But I it, it's synonymous with clam grazing. Just pure and simple. Okay. Benthic grazing is the clams. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So my first suggestion uh, concerns a biological pattern that I observe in the Sacramento River that doesn't seem to be getting much attention, but I think uh, uh, influences the extent to which the Sacramento River could uh, serve as a source of pelagic food for downstream communities or even as a source of food for the organisms that are being transported uh, in the river. So significant consumption of phytoplankton production by clams in the low salinity zone uh, implies that at least seasonally, plankton transported in the uh, main rivers of the delta could be an important food subsidy uh, for downstream areas. So if so, uh, we should find out why phytoplankton biomass declines in the Sacramento River starting above the city of Sacramento. This slide shows several data sets that illustrate that phytoplankton biomass, including diatom biomass, frequently declines in the Sacramento River starting above Sacramento. These graphs are longitudinal surveys of phytoplankton biomass that were conducted by Alex Parker and his colleagues during five different months. Uh, results from July and November of 2008 are shown on the left, and from March, April, and May 2009 shown on the right. The various bars and lines inside the graph are different measures of phytoplankton biomass, and in this uh, set of graphs, the light green bars indicate chlorophyll in the size category of phytoplankton that most diatoms we're interested in um, belong in. In these graphs, the most upstream station sampled was at the I-80 bridge, so just before the river enters the urban area of Sacramento. And the most downstream station in these graphs is uh, either Isleton or Rio Vista, depending on the data set. The graphs show you that there's not always a marked decline in phytoplankton biomass in this part of the river, as shown in March and May of 2009. But when there is a marked decline, it begins at the most upstream station sampled, and the, in this case, uh, the I-80 bridge, rather than somewhere downstream. And for reference, I've highlighted in the purple boxes the portion of these transects that lie above the SAC Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant, just so you can orient yourself. This slide puts April 2009 results 
into a larger geographic context by showing the results for the transect continuing on down the Sacramento River and into Sassoon Bay. In this graph, the blue bars represent diatom biomass, and the line connecting the green squares shows uh, essentially total chlorophyll in the water column. In this graph, uh, I've shown the portion of the overall transect that lies above the treatment plant discharge in the red box, and we see that uh, diatom biomass declined by almost two-thirds before the water even reaches the treatment plant. So this data to me illustrates that at least at the time this transect was was uh, measured, the various processes that affect diet, or not just diatom, but general phytoplankton biomass in the river, um, were operating such that the majority of phytoplankton biomass loss occurred starting at the I-80 bridge and before we get to the uh, treatment plant discharge. So I only have four data slides, so bear with me. We're almost done. Um, this slide shows the average results from several monthly transects that the Central Valley Regional Board conducted in 2009. And in their study, the most upstream station they sampled was at Tower Bridge. So those results are shown on the left. Um, and again, we see that there's a decrease in phytoplankton biomass that begins the most upstream station sampled rather than at some point downstream. Okay, and finally, these are some more recent data from April 2010 that were reported in this spring's IEP newsletter. Uh, in these plots, the upstream-downstream direction has been uh, flipped so that the results from the most upstream station are now at, which is again the I-80 bridge, are now on the right side of the graphs. The left-hand graph shows results in terms of chlorophyll and the right-hand graph shows results in terms of number of fluorescent particles, which can be uh, considered a proxy for the number of phytoplankton cells. And so again, we see that there's a decrease in phytoplankton biomass that occurred in the river starting at the most upstream station. Um, but in this particular case, the decline in biomass wasn't observed as far downstream. In other words, it didn't go all the way to Isleton. So what interests me about this pattern is that we have no idea how far upstream this kind of decline begins, and no hypotheses are being addressed to my knowledge that would explain why we get a decrease starting uh, in phytoplankton biomass starting already as water enters the delta. And consequently, we don't know if some process it, that's causing that is contributing to patterns we see extending further down into the river. Diana, how, how do you factor in some type of an anticipated baseline level, and how do you deal with seasonal or monthly variability as far as temperatures and water volumes and all of that? I mean, it, this is all interesting, but I, I don't know how you establish what a baseline was or what would be anticipated under other conditions. Well, I think we don't have that many transects available to us. As a matter of fact, the ones that I've shown in these slides are about all the ones that have been published that, that I've seen. So we, you know, there's a focus on spring sampling in these events. So we have, you know, March, April, May transects. So I don't actually know what the pattern would look like later in the year. Normal IEP sampling doesn't occur on this finest scale. And it's one of my recommendations that, you know, will come in, a, in the next slide is, is for monitoring to understand at what point upstream, you know, are we seeing the results of a bloom that is formed in the river further upstream and is sort of starting to senesce and dissipate as it, as it reaches the legal delta? Is there some uh, step change at some place? And, and we're seeing, you know, we don't see a step change within the delta in these patterns. So we just don't know. I don't know, is this a Calusa, a night's landing? Where is this phytoplankton growing? How many days? I mean, your point about seasonality is that certainly the phytoplankton take different numbers of days in transit in the river before they even reach the delta. So understanding how far back you'd have to go to understand what environmental conditions caused 
the phytoplankton to grow that might be disappearing, you know, that, that's, a, that's an important question that I can't answer with these, these transects. Thank you. So my suggestions regarding this particular uncertainty are, are pretty simple. What, well, not on the slide is that I think we should decide um, how important is this type of subsidy anyway? Are we that interested in understanding and, and perhaps facilitating a subsidy of phytoplankton that comes into the delta in the first place? Um, and if we are then, I think we should be conducting research that addresses processes that apply to the whole portion of the Sacramento River where patterns are observed. And so part and parcel with that is uh, I think we should conduct frequent, finely spaced monitoring starting well above the legal delta so that we can understand what the larger pattern is and whether we can, um, you know, what, what is producing this subsidy, where does it begin, is there a, a long trend uh, that we don't understand or is something happening, you know, for example, right where the American River comes in? I, I don't know. We just don't know. But it seems worth asking. Um, could I ask a question? We, we uh, yesterday heard about uh, the importance potentially of San Joaquin River's uh, contribution of phytoplankton to the delta. How would you place this? Um, um, you know, these uh, data in that context, how does this compare to San Joaquin River? Well, I think that's a really interesting question because, you know, we just, uh, Doug Dale and his colleagues, they just, uh, you know, in that same IEP newsletter, they published a nice comparison of the kinds of phytoplankton they're observing and some different ways of measuring that, which get away from laborious microscopy uh, results. Um, and I think it's a fair question because we see more phytoplankton in that river and there's some evidence that there's different kinds of phytoplankton in the river. So it's kind of a judgment call. Do we want to sort of uh, write off the Sacramento River in terms of, you know, it was characterized um, yesterday as a, as a desert. Well, is, is that what, you know, are we going to settle for it being a desert and sort of shift our emphasis to creating and moving food that's produced further down in the interior delta into areas where we want it or hope that the fish will utilize the plankton in the San Joaquin River? But the bottom line is uh, delta smelt do move up into the lower Sacramento River for spawning and, and rearing activity. And so if phytoplankton that are moved down from the border of the delta into the Isleton area, that plankton is available for tidal sloshing up and down into the Cache Slough area. So, you know, Cache Slough is, is both a taker, it both taketh and giveth, you know, in terms of phytoplankton. So I, I don't think it's appropriate to, to write off that subsidy, but, but it is, it could be a management decision to say we're not going to, you know, quibble over that much chlorophyll coming down the Sacramento River. We've got bigger fish to fry, so to speak, somewhere else in the Delta. Um, I, I think it's a fair question. I do. Um, so my next overall suggestion is to consider the direct effects of residence time on plankton uh, when managing flows. So residence times in delta water bodies are an outcome of flow management that is distinct from other outcomes such as maintaining the position of X2 or managing for the volume of the low salinity zone. And I say this because as we were, uh, as was mentioned yesterday uh, in the expert panel, once water enters the legal delta, it can take a variety of paths and spend a variety of time in different delta water bodies before it finally leaves and becomes officially a part of net delta outflow. So that's what I'm referring to is, is the time and the pathways that water uh, takes through the delta. So this slide lists some of the reasons, but not all the reasons why residence time is an important driver of the pelagic food web. First, phytoplankton taxa have different intrinsic growth rates. Uh, this means that even when light, nutrients, and other conditions are sufficient for maximum growth to occur, some species 
will grow more fast, will grow uh, more quickly than others. So that means the rate at which we move water through a channel or slosh it in and out of a flooded island or an embayment will affect which species appear to persist at a specific location or which ones can, and can form a bloom in a particular locale. So it's kind of a conundrum because the fish, the pelagic fish which can position themselves uh, in particular places will experience and be able to take advantage of phytoplankton that are blooming even though the phytoplankton aren't, aren't blooming in that place necessarily they can be you know growing in a parcel of water that's moving by so so it's, it's such an interesting process because you have to think about phytoplankton and zooplankton as moving through a system and the fish being in the pl right place at the right time in order to eat the food that's in that water that's moving slowly by. So it's, it's very easy to start thinking about static locales and what's happening in those. But if the water is moving back and forth or, or seaward gradually, um, you know, the blooms are occurring in moving water, uh, which makes it very interesting but also very hard to think about sometimes. So riverine transport time also affects biogeochemical processing. Uh, the amount of time uh, it takes a parcel to go from point A to B determines how uh, much nutrient transformations can take place or, or decomposition or nutrient uptake, for example. And, and that affects what we get at one place um, compared to, to another, what we have to work with uh, for, for generating the currency of, of planktonic food. Um, also, residence time affects the contact time between plankton and stationary filters, such as beds of clams or aquatic weeds. So I've long been kind of interested in the extent to which we slosh water back and forth over clam hotspots, for example, that will increase naturally the amount of loss we have uh, to those clams, whereas it might be advantageous if we understand where those hot spots are to kind of keep the water moving along so we don't, we don't lose as much to uh, clam grazing. And aquatic weed beds can also serve as filters, removing particles from suspension. And we know that that's a factor in removing inorganic particles, sediment from water, but it, it would also have an effect on other suspended particles, which are food for fishes. So the final point on this slide is that zooplankton are plankton also, so their location and population size are also affected by water movements. And zooplankton have very limited abilities to control their location in the estuary. And what's kind of fun is that some of the copepods in the estuary perform what I call a tidal hopscotch, where they can move higher in the water column during flood tide so that they kind of get move advected or moved uh, landward. And then they can uh, sink in the water column on the ebb tide uh, because you're the closer you are to the sediments, the less quickly the water's moving. And so by kind of gaming the system in that way, they can try to combat the relentless, gradual seaward transport uh, that's occurring in the water that they live in. But not all the copepods do that. So some are more vulnerable to seaward transport than others. So I find that very interesting, but also something we need to think about if we're considering residence time and its effect on the food web. And would it, would it be fair to say in what you're telling us that a, de a, a slowing of the transit time or a lengthening of the transit time produces more phytoplankton and it gives it a chance to build and grow, but it also enables benthic grazing to a greater extent because while you're producing more of it, there's more time for the grazing. Well, yeah. How do, you how do you unravel that? Well, I mean, it's tough. But I think one thing that I would love to see more uh, acknowledgement or uh, understanding of is where are clam hotspots? And I'm not really talking about Sassoon Bay today. I'm kind of tired of thought, thinking and talking about Sassoon Bay. So I'm thinking about the interior delta where there's a lot of patchy distribution of freshwater clams, for example. And these beds of aquatic weeds we're all uh, you know, worried about. Um, there, there's a, this interesting balance because if you slow the water down too much, you start to favor species of phytoplankton that are considered by most, you know, folks in the in the arena uh, to be negative. You know, you can encourage 
blooms of microcystis, you can get some of the noxious forms of algae, can outcompete some of the ones we prefer to see, like diatoms, if the water's too slow. So there's kind of this sweet spot where if you move the water way too fast, nothing can keep up with it. And sure, clam grazing may be minimal, but it, on the other hand, the fish are not going to experience uh, increases where they're sitting and feeding. Um, and, and so you get this balancing act. And, and frankly, if, I, if somebody paid me to do it, I could sit down and think really hard about the number of days in different particle transport model runs and, and, and compare that to the growth rates of different phytoplankton and try to get an idea how, how would we game the system if we were trying to engineer it for a particular species? And, and you know, I know, I know Richard Dugdale is thinking about that, too, in terms of what's happening in Sassoon Bay. So, but, yeah, it's, it's a little tricky. But I think some of the, uh, the spatial location issues, you know, could help us here. Where are clams? Are there hot spots? Are they a concern in the San Joaquin River? We see more plankton there. Is that happening in spite of clam grazing rates or not? I, you know, I don't know. So I hope that was, that was probably a terrible answer, but uh, there you go. <laughs> um, so, uh, I was just picturing one of those graphs where all the arrows kind of pointed towards each other. That's why I was. Yeah, yeah, I, can, I, I, I hear I you. I what you're saying. Thank I you. I hear you on that. Um, so, so this diagram uh, is another uh, something I think about with uh, resi related to residence time is that as we embark on habitat restoration, it's going to affect residence time in a lot of interesting ways. This picture shows a hypothetical uh, channel before and after it becomes connected to new flooded habitat. And in the upper diagram, uh, as river water is sort of sloshing back and forth because of the tides, uh, uh, it will have a resident, a parcel of water will have a residence time that's equivalent to the length of time it takes it to travel down that pathway uh, shown by the dark arrow. But then after we attach it to a new flooded habitat, some of the tidal prism that's locally available will now be absorbed by the new habitat. And as a consequence, you might, you'll get a reduced tidal range in the channel above it and, and likely shorter transit time. So as we think about optimizing residence time, if we end up doing that, um, we also need to realize that as we uh, increase our, our tidal uh, uh, wetlands and so forth, it, it, it's going to have subsequent effects on residence time. So we need to plan ahead if we think residence time is important. Um, I got I, just a question. You know, as we contemplate uh, restoration of floodplain and tidal wetland and that connectivity. What we're trying to do in, in the productivity scheme is add productivity and compete with phytoplankton as a, as a productivity driver of the system. That's my understanding. Could we reach a point, a threshold, where uh, wetland productivity and, f and the food story there starts to eclipse the importance of the phytoplankton food web? Well, I think the, the, a lot of the productivity we expect um, to obtain in the tidal habitat is actually from the water columns. So some of the ideas in these shallow habitats, we get high, high rates of primary production by phytoplankton, which can then grow zooplankton. And also phytoplankton can fuel some of the little critters that hang out in the reed beds and the other emergent uh, vegetation there. So. I know there's, there is thought that there's other, there's other forms of carbon cycling that are going to occur in these wetlands, uh, you know, detritus-based productivity. But I think, and, I, and I'd be happy to be corrected by anyone here today, but I, re I really think a lot of the bang for our buck that we're expecting, even in these tile wetlands, is based on uh, phytoplankton growth in those wetlands. So you're right, maybe, maybe the hope is that some of this river channel stuff will subside in importance because these wetlands will be so great. Um, but I also think that part of the reason we're even talking about a dual conveyance is because we've already made the decision that we want a bunch of that stuff growing in the San Joaquin River to uh, make it further down the estuary. I mean, I, I think that's part of the assumption there. I know entrainment is under discussion, but there's also a thought that the San Joaquin River might be a better, uh, you know, engine for, for plankton. Um, so, so, you know, to wrap up this part of my, my 
talk and my suggestion is that you know I think it would be interesting to consider whether residence times associated with particular flow criteria are conducive to growing the desired types of plankton in the right places and transporting them to the right places. And I think that the various infrastructure associated with water projects could really be utilized here to, to deliver a range of residence times without compromising other metrics that the fisheries experts and, and, and the balancing of beneficial uses and all that might deem are, are appropriate for, for the delta. And, and we could possibly even employ adaptive management where if we're, if we're, we're not getting the results we, we think we ought to be getting by use of these other larger gross metrics, then maybe we can see, well, maybe we need to tweak residence time and will that help? Will that grow us some more for food for the fishes without compromising the, water, uh, the other standards that have been imposed? So it's an interesting question because sometimes I think water would be benefited from moving at different speeds and in different places in the delta, but that may not be exactly the right thing for salmon smolts, for example. But uh, um, you know that that's that's part of the complexity. But there is an uncertainty associated with these gross metrics that we're thinking about using as standards, and some of that uncertainty might be uh, resolved by addressing residence times to to improve the certainty that that they'll have a good effect and not a blasé effect or a bad effect. Oops. Oh, how do you go back? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, all I missed was the, how do I get, oh, there it goes. Ah, there we go. So my third overall suggestion is to incorporate benthic grazing into the BDC effects analysis. So the issue as I see it is that the habitat restoration component of the BDCP assumes in part that new habitat will be a net producer of food to fuel the pelagic food web. However, the BDCP effects analysis assigned habitat productivity value to future wetlands using a formula that did not account for clam grazing. So I'll avoid benthic grazing, but clam grazing. I didn't ask you that sarcastically. I just no, 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 no. It's just I'm so used to saying benthic grazing, I'm going to have to catch myself now. It's one of my... Uh, it's in my vocabulary now. Good, it's gonna, good. You know, it's there. So uh, BDCP assigned these unitless prod acre scores to the restoration opportunity areas in the effects analysis based on predicted habitat depth in the ROAs and a formula from Lopez et al. 2006, which converts habitat depth to primary production. This was a study of what drives production in shallow habitats, especially like flooded islands like Mildred Island and uh, Frank's Tract. And this snippet, this graph um, on the, uh, not this graph, this uh, little graphic on the slide is a snippet from a larger table in the effects analysis showing various categories of future habitat for cash slough in that ROA, the, the average depth assigned to those future habitats, and then in the far right side, uh, the, these unitless prod acre uh, scores that, that were given. But the problem is that the formula that was used to come up with the prod acre scores was created by, th by its authors to estimate gross phytoplankton production in shallow habitat, not net production after benthic grazing. So the graph here is only important be as a curiosity. I, I just show the data set from Lopez et al., which generated the formula in red, which is uh, the formula that BDCP leveraged to come up with these prod acre scores. But what's ironic is that in the same study referenced by the BDCP, uh, Lopez et al. also determined net phytoplankton production after grazing rates by the freshwater clam corbicula were included in the model. And what they discovered is where habitats were less than six meters deep, so that's pretty deep, right? Less than six meters. Sites with clams had approximately six times lower net ma maximum net primary production than sites without clams. And these are two important quotes from their study. Whereas shallow pelagic systems routinely functioned as net sources of phytoplankton biomass, 
This trend was not true when we accounted for losses to corbicula. Our results show that corbicula colonization will determine a habitat's value to the pelagic food web. Can I, can I ask a quick question? I'm a little ignorant of the, uh, the corbicula, where it uh, occupies uh, the water column. Where, what's its range typically? Um, well, they live vertically. In, they live in the sediment. So anywhere, all the way to intertidal, or oh, or what's their vertical range? Oh, their vertical range. Is that well, in, for example, in this study, they were present even to sites that were six meters deep, but then on to shallow water too. But if there's a clam biologist in the in the room, I'd be happy for them to say if there's a, like I don't think they can tolerate uh, intermittent drying. So like I don't think they'd be in intertidal habitat, so shallow but subtitle. probably subtidal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but that's a good question. I don't know how much drawing they can tolerate. Um, so, but this omit. That's a good point about which categories of habitat might be more or less vulnerable to corbicular grazing. That's a really good point. Um, so I think this omission is kind of important because although corbicula are very patchy in their distribution, they're ubiquitous in the freshwater delta. Uh, for example, the spring 2012 IEP newsletter characterized corbicula as quote unquote abundant year round in 2011 at all these sites that, at all of the IEP sites where benthic uh, invertebrates were sampled, including Rio Vista, Twitchell Island, Old River, Stockton, Clifton Court, Forbay, and the confluence zone. So, one of my questions is what, what is the scale of this potential problem? You know, are the new colonies going to potentially uh, occupy these, this new habit completely at random? Are there factors that drive where they, these new colonies form? If a colony comes into one of these new habitats, is it game over for one year or for 10 years? I mean, I just haven't seen any discussion or acknowledgement of this potential problem. Um, so I wonder, uh, have we already thoughtfully predetermined that the ROAs are going to be immune from this problem for some reason? Um, and, and if not, you know, are we running the risk of this bet hedging, you know, uh, strategy for the BDCP to turn into uh, like a corbicula crapshoot? You know, I don't know. I, I, just, I just think we need to... Uh, I, I think it's worth talking about. I really do. So I think that's a huge uncertainty. Um, so how do, what do I think we could do about it? Uh, one, one step, at least for honest discussion, would be to adjust the habitat value scores for the ROAs using rational estimates for clam colonization rates in the ROAs. And then perhaps a tipping some kind, applying some sort of tipping point to predict how much new habitat will be a net sink rather than a net source of phytoplankton. Uh, this, you know, this could be depth, it could be depth and fetch because fetch affects how much circulation there is and how vulnerable phytoplankton resources are to being grazed by clams and so forth. And I don't know the answer here. I've been thinking a lot about it and I really don't know the answer. Um, and then I also think this is an opportunity for adaptive management where we could observe clam colonization rates in early projects and then alter the strategy if we find out the new uh, wetlands are operating as a net sink for primary production. Maybe we could alter the inundation depths that we have planned for the next projects or even the ones that are already kind of screwed up if they get screwed up. Uh, maybe choose different locations. Uh, maybe put an emphasis on intertidal if, if, if what Steve was, was saying is, is true, that that's a sort of cutoff point for clams. Also connectivity. You know, we don't want a new habitat that costs a lot and, and was a lot of effort and all of a sudden becomes a, a phytoplankton sink because it's a big clam colony. We don't want that to start acting like a vacuum cleaner sucking phytoplankton out of the water from other nearby habitats that may be more productive. So this idea that, that uh, we don't want there to be endless do loops in the delta with water running around in circles, you know, I, I think that's really worth thinking about. Uh, we, we may want to really focus on these dendritic shaped uh, wetlands where if one arm, so to speak, goes, you know, uh, it becomes a mess because of clams, the other arms are, are the productivity is somewhat, somewhat less connected to that, that disaster, you know, so. Um, Anyway, so that's my two, two cents about 
clam colonization and, and the BDCP uh, effects analysis. Well, you've definitely broadened my vocabulary today. We've got the benthic grazing and the corbicula crapshoot. I mean, I'm, I can <laughs> talk this stuff now. Okay, so my fourth, uh, my fourth overall suggestion is to, uh, well, let me find my notes here, is to branch out um, in the experimental approaches that, uh, that we're using to study uh, nutrient effects in the delta. So short-term experiments using small closed containers that are nicknamed named in the business cubitainers have been the principal direct approach used to investigate nutrient effects on phytoplankton in the delta. So in this approach, water from different locations is collected, placed in these translucent plastic containers. Um, nutrients might be added to the containers if that's one of the goals of, of that particular round of testing is to see those effects, um, but maybe not. And But in any case, uh, isotopes are injected into the containers which allow you to tra track the rate of uptake of carbon or nutrients. And then, the, and then the phytoplankton are followed for a few, for many hours or even up to a few days, usually like three days is usually the maximum amount of time that, that you follow these, these containers. Um, well, this approach has so far yielded at least five publications in which cubitainer experiment results are used to support conclusions about the role of nutrients in the delta food web. And, and those are listed here. And, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if by the end of this proceeding, we, we've already got another couple out. Um, but, the, but the problem is, despite repeated rounds of these experiments in various parts of the estuary and in the, in the river, the Sacramento River, there's no current agreement that the rate measurements that, are con that we obtain from these experiments explain broader patterns of primary or secondary production in the estuary, or that they're controlling who the players are in the food web. Okay, so this is an opinion here. Uh, it's my opinion that short-term, small, closed container experiments won't lead to consensus regarding whether the San Francisco estuary food web is driven by nutrient concentrations or ratios. And so this diagram will hopefully explain why I have that opinion. This is a simplified diagram of the food web leading to pelagic fishes. Um, and it has nutrients on the bottom along with organic carbon that would come from detritus. The green arrows show, simulate, uh, or symbolize, I should say, the production and consumption of phytoplankton. The red arrows show how bacteria is consumed by these real small critters, these uh, protozoans that are referred to as microzooplankton, which are an important food for several of the copepods in the estuary, and unfortunately also for clams. Um, the pink arrows show how copepod biomass is divvied up between clams, pelagic fish, and invasive jellies, which have more recently invaded the estuary. And then the purple arrows on the right side show the excretion of nutrients back into the water column as the higher organisms metabolize their food and grow. So now I've added a yellow circle at the bottom of the slide that shows the corner of the overall food web that cubitainer experiments address. So one of the shortcomings of this approach for extrapolating to the whole food web is that they don't, that we cannot directly demonstrate the food value of the mixtures of phytoplankton that end up growing in these containers to the organisms that eat them in the estuary because those organisms aren't in those containers and using that food. And I think this is especially important because the copepods, including the calanoid copepods that are so important to delta smelt, are shown in direct feeding experiments using natural suspensions of water from the estuary to not only utilize but often prefer these modal tiny organisms, these flagellated organisms called microzooplankton that are in the water. So yes, they consume phytoplankton, but phytoplankton, but they don't rely on it necessarily, and they even prefer not to eat phytoplankton in, as demonstrated by some experiments. So 
uh, so I think that's, that's kind of an issue. The other is that if we don't have the higher organisms in these experiments, we can't demonstrate whether or not the feedback, the chemical feedback represented by the purple arrows is occurring uh, and whether that's affecting the chemical composition of the other organisms in the food web, including the consumers, um, or whether that chemical feedback's affecting uh, the winners in, in this competition. But that feedback is an important part of the stoichiometric ar uh, theory that argues that N2P ratios ultimately controls, you know, who are the winners in, in the food web game. So, so I think that that's also a, a conceptual shortcoming uh, of, uh, of this approach. Uh, I have a quick question. Sure. So your, your point uh, that, I, that I gather is on that last graph, yeah, the red arrows aren't accounted for in the cubitainer results. Is that right? The, re the, the, the pathway from nutrients to bacteria to the food web. Well, the, there will certainly be bacteria collected in the water that goes in these cubitainers, but the, and, and actually this is probably a good question for, um, for Dick Dugdale, is whether or not they're able to distinguish uh, uh, nitrogen uptake in these containers that might be uh, contributing to bacterial growth, but carbon uptake is specific to the phytoplankton, not the bacteria. So the, the principal goal of these containers, at least as I've understood, is to try to understand what the short-term rates are that the phytoplankton are, are producing. Yeah, do you have a sense of the relative magnitude uh, of you know, the significance of the nutrients to phytoplankton versus nutrients to bacteria? Wow, for nutrient uptake, no, I don't really have a good sense for that, but I know that there's a general feeling that the bacterial pathways uh, may be less efficient because there's more steps involved, so you lose a little energy at each step, um, and I think that's probably a fair uh, uh, generalization to make in some cases. But, but it, it is kind of a pet peeve with me that we, we've, you know, we're entertaining this sort of dogma that diatoms beget copepods that beget fish, you know, and it's more complicated than that out there. These copepods have really complicated nutrition. And, and I, I do believe that although phytoplankton are important, and blooms would logically, you would think they are important, um, these, co these copepods aren't, you know, they don't just sit down and eat diatoms. They, they consume a lot of things. So I think it's just worth talking about. Um, so anyway, just not to belabor the point, I'll try to go quickly, but these are other, uh, other, um, you know, okay, thanks, Mike. Um, these are other uh, uh, processes that aren't measured in the, in the short-term uh, experiments. Competition between zooplankton, the toxic effects of some diatoms on copepods, which can cause the uh, copepod offspring to uh, fail to develop. Uh, of course, clam grazing is not incorporated. Uh, the physiological response of phytoplankton to exposure to variable light levels as they circulate in the water column, which can affect their growth rates. Residence time isn't incorporated because there's no flow through. And then vertical migrations of phytoplankton and zooplankton aren't, aren't accounted for. And this is important because out there in the real world, phytoplankton can adjust their position, some phytoplankton anyway, can it control their buoyancy so they'll hang out at different depths. And, uh, and so, oh, did I just turn off my mic? No, it's on. Um, and uh, zooplankton also do that. Um, but this can, this can affect who eats who and where and when and how much. And, and so if everybody's crowded into a little container, uh, even if they were in there to begin with, it, it wouldn't really replicate the kinds of interactions that occur in the real world too well. Okay, so well, so because we don't have direct demonstrations that nutrient effects trickle all the way up to the top of the food web in the ways that have been proposed, we've been recently asked to rely quite a bit on statistical analyses and other kinds of indirect or circumstantial information to extrapolate from this uptake behavior all the way up to population dynamics of the fish that we uh, want to manage. And, and to me, this is a problem because it's not generating consensus on important issues. So here, here's my hopefully practical suggestion for future experimental work. I, I'd like to see added into the mix 
uh, some larger scale, longer term, ideally flow through mesocosm type experiments. Um, these are large enclosures, uh, often many meters deep. They're ideally suspended in the, in the uh, water to allow a more natural light and temperature field. Uh, also allows vertical migrations to occur. They could be populated with zooplankton and maybe even clams. Um, maybe by hanging suspended colonization plates inside the, the enclosures. They could be plumbed to allow manipulation of residence time and run long enough to have multiple generations of zooplankton and successional sequences of algae, which, which is useful because in nature, so phytoplankton, a particular species or suite of species can bloom, but then a bloom doesn't last forever. It's a, it senesces, subsides, and then conditions may be then favorable for other phytoplankton, which for all we know, you know, go on to have a, an equally important role in the next round of zooplankton reproduction and whatnot. But this, this type of approach might, might allow us to, to look at some of these interactions. And, and these are just pictures I grabbed off the internet a couple evenings ago of mesocosms type experiments being conducted in lakes and estuaries. And I have a summary slide, but you know, uh, Mike has informed me that I've taken much more than my fair share. So I'm just going to let you read that at your leisure. Um, and then to also thank you so much for the opportunity to give you my two cents on these uh, particular topics. It was about a dollar and a quarter, I think. I, <laughs> I got, yeah, I got more than two cents, didn't I? <laughs> uh, one thing that I'd like to um, ask the invited expert panel to think, to be prepared at the end of this uh, effort um, today, uh, <laughs> it will be today, right, Charlie? Um, that uh, to, you gave us three different um, parts to, uh, to research that's going on and our, our research opportunities, things that would reduce uncertainty, some cutting edge new things. I see Peter in the back. And, um, and some of the stuff that has, has gone on. Are you, uh, in, in listening to what's been going on today, are, you, uh, are there some new things that are coming out that you think are worth changing on your lists that you've given us already or is there something that would that you want to highlight particularly because of some of the information that you've heard today and um, so I, I will be very interested in what um, and, and if you're going to make any changes in your list or if it's your lists are going to stay just like they are thank you particularly because of this, this last uh, presentation, uh, there are a lot of suggestions for, for science. Diane, I want to ask you one quick question. Uh, yesterday we heard a number of speakers um, talk about flows, and everything was flow-centric. In some of their opinions, there wasn't anything else on the table but flows, and it was always more flows, not less. What I'm hearing you say, I believe, is in certain circumstances in regards to the food chain or the food web, lower flows might in fact be better. Is that correct? Well, I, th I think. As long as you can pass them over the clam pasture. Oh, yeah. Once you, yeah, whisk them through the, the weed beds and the clam fields. Um, I, 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 think, I think that timing is really important. I think that. We can have, and it's going to be a balancing act because we already have a condition in the delta which has been characterized by Peter Moyle and several other people as being more lake-like than river-like in the interior delta. And that, that may be, be a big factor why we have the suite of predators we do, uh, problems with uh, immer uh, invasive aquatic weeds and, and, and even the uh, emergence of some toxic phytoplankton which are more more normally thought of in, in here's another word, lentic environments, which are sort of lake-like environments. So I think we are, depending on the season and the locale, we're already operating in an area where we probably need to speed things along a little bit. But then w one thing that, that is, is interesting to me is if you, if you push water along quickly, yes, you might remove food from one place, maybe even out of the freshwater delta, but 
one habitat's loss of food in a moving system is a gain for the next habitat downstream. So in, in terms of managing fish, we want to think, well, if we, if we speed water up, uh, you know, in the San Joaquin River, and then that, that plankton may be flushed, you know, uh, out a little faster, well, will that be food for where the water ends up and is out at the right time? But no, I, I, I don't think we, we want lower flows than we have now because we already show symptoms that, that water is, is moving too slowly in a lot of places. But I think that once we have new water standards within, within those flow standards, which accommodate important fisheries considerations that have nothing to do with what I've talked about here today, um, I think that we might then want to examine whether or not we can optimize residence time. And that may include speeding it up at times, but if we really replumb the system, we may find that we do need to slow it down in some places a little bit too. But I, I think we've got enough good minds working on the subject that, and particle tracking models and all kinds of great tools that we could really, I mean, we don't have to stumble around in the blind here. We can really, we can really take a look at what the models are telling us and, and, and think about how to speed things up or slow things down in, in different areas. Hopefully it'll be an interesting conversation, but if we have time today, I would, part of my questions at the end of this workshop will be to talk to some of the fisheries folks about invasives. If you have the opportunity to stay, you might find that hopefully interesting if I'm able to frame the questions in the way I would like to, so. Chair Hoppen, I'm Michael Connor. Um, uh, trains as coastal ecologist, uh, manager of the East Bay Discharges Authority. Um, originally, uh, Dr. Engel was going to speak at the first uh, session. I was going to coordinate some of my comments with hers. I just wanted to take, I promised Bo Brock I'd take five minutes or less to uh, reflect on her comments and play it in the larger perspective. Um, I'd also like to comment on some of the questions asked by the board members uh, prior and, uh, and, and combine in there. I think her uh, presentation, particularly on this residence time issue, rel which relates to flow, is crucial to the board. And as you mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Hoppin, the issue of, well, if we slow flow down and if we have less flows, then that fits into the, uh, the water contractor's play that says we'd get more food production um, in the Delta and in Sassoon Bay. And that's, if you're going to play it, you have to play both ends. And I think as each of your individual questions, house flow relate to turbidity, relate to um, uh, grazers, relate to predators, relate to light. These are complicated questions that you can answer qualitatively, but really to answer them quantitatively, you're going to need a really good model. And so in the Bay, we know that most of the time the Bay, Sassoon Bay, seems to be light limited. Uh, Dr. Dugdale's crucial play in his model is residence time, and it's definitely residence time limited. There's only a few days where the residence time is slow enough that allows phytoplankton growth. Then the nutrient play comes in, but as you've seen also, that in much of the year, maybe nine, eight, nine months of the year, you're limited by the clam grazing rates. So these are how to integrate these into what it means overall for the bay. You really are going to need a complicated model to try to fit it all in. Um, and that's why uh, I reiterate my push from the first time that we've got to um, integrate together the uh, NNE process, the nutrient uh, endpoint process that's going on in the Bay starting in Sassoon with what you do in the Delta and that the two have to be fit together because most of the uh, concern about food production uh, in the Delta, in the, in the Sassoon is driven by what's coming from upstream. Um, as someone who's uh, run a $10 million model in Massachusetts Bay to look at food chain effects. Um, it's going to be a big challenge to make it work, and uh, you're, you're probably talking 50 to $100 million, and it may reduce your uncertainty from 50% uncertainty to 40% uncertainty. So, it's, so the question is, are there some other alternatives? And uh, John Largier also mentioned the idea of uh, flow management experiments, and uh, also John Kane had a great idea yesterday of using the YOLO 
bypass as a as a test of a way to test the outcome which it's easy to turn on and off and uh, Dr. Engel in her presentation said well you know we could adjust flow to the bay and look at different residence times and see how that works and I I strongly encourage that I think those ideas would be a a, a manageable way in a shorter period of time for you to get some results that would uh, y yield some useful management outcomes for you. I think what's crucial as we're seeing from VAMP is to uh, beforehand decide, uh, make sure you've got criteria for how do we decide if our flow management process experiment worked or not that we decide to do it the second year. What criteria are we going to use to judge it? And you need those criteria first rather than afterwards and then how do we decide if we go the second year or the third year and so I'd really encourage the board to uh, to do that so uh, and finally uh, I think your emphasis on utilizing the independent science board is really a smart way to go I'd be tempted to uh, be more focused in your questions to the Inter independent science board um, so that they can focus on very specific alternatives that you have and what are the pros and cons and where the science is taking you on some of those issues. Um, I find a lot of their comments so overarching that it's sort of hard to know what to do with. And so I think if you, you focused them, that would be helpful. That's my five minutes. Chair Hoffman, members of the board, um, thank you so much for providing this opportunity for us to input into the Bay Delta Plan. My name is Deanna Serino, and I'm with Contra Costa Water District. Am I close enough to the mic? Okay. I um, This is all very interesting topic, and I actually have quite a bit of um, comments I'd like to make on the issues, but I want to change gears here right now and shift to talk a little bit about Old and Middle River flow objectives, possibly revisit this a little bit later. Um, Again, I'm with Contra Costa Water District. Just briefly, we're an in-delta diverter serving uh, about a half million people in the Bay Area. Our beneficial use is primarily M&I, although we do also have ag, uh, recreation, and fish and wildlife beneficial uses as well. We do have our own water rights. We have a water right license and a few permits. But in addition, we are a CVP contractor. Makes us kind of unique. Um, as a CVP contractor, though, we do not um, divert from the export facilities in the South Delta down here. As, which are the yellow dots on the map. We have four of our own intakes, which are shown as the green diamonds, um, and we don't divert at all times from those intakes. We kind of shift around and divert based on water quality and fish needs as well. Um, so that's just a little bit about us to give you an idea of where we're coming from. Um, we're coming here today with a single concrete focus for the State Board, and we do have input on a lot of these other issues that we'd be happy to talk to you and staff about, but I want to be very focused in the presentation today, and the recommendation is simply this. If the State Board chooses to implement Old and Middle River flow objectives, we recommend that you rely on a flow index for implementation rather than the USGS OMR. So I'm not suggesting that you develop Old and Middle River flow standards, and I'm not out telling you what that numerical criteria should be should you do it. Simply saying that if you go down that path and you find it, that it's justified for the Bay Delta, that we recommend that you do it based on a flow index. So why? Why go to a flow index when over the last couple years they've been implementing based on what people refer to as the USGS OMR? First and foremost, the current method has problems with the implementation, and I'm going to cover those a little bit. And we, we talked about that a little bit at the March 2010 Delta Flow Criteria Proceedings, if you recall. There's implementation problems, and at that time, the State Board asked the stakeholders to propose a solution to these implementation issues for these objectives. Um, we took that to heart, and we set forward with two objectives to find a solution. The first and foremost, obviously, we have to solve the implementation problems. But the second, which is an, a co-equal objective, if you will, um, we have to provide fish protection that is equivalent to the current uh, method, which uses the USGS OMRs. So I'm just going to walk you briefly through the implementation issues. Um, this is, the first one is simply that the daily values are not available in real time. And this is just an artifact of the calculation and how things are done. The plot before you um, shows the three time series that are available for any given station on the USGS website. Um, the blue lines are the measurements at 15 minute, or uh, flow calculated by, from the velocity measurements at like a 15 minute time step. So you see the tidal variability. 
the red line shows the tidally filtered time series, and this is a mathematical construct. Um, there's different types of filters that are applied, and the USGS is using a centered Godin filter for this. And finally, the black dots are the daily average of the tidal filtered data. Um, it's important to recognize, and I, I added a little highlight area here, that based on the mathematical filtering that's done, to calculate